You're watching Grassroots Community TV, the nation's original community-operated television station, protecting and nurturing open channels of communication for the citizens of the Roaring Fork Valley since 1972. So our next speaker, Joshua Bloom, with uh, Community Land Use and Economics Group, is going to talk to us. And what intrigued me about Josh's work is not only his history with the uh, National Historic Preservation Main Street Program, which has been looking at local economic development for a number of years, But he's also very familiar with these, the ideas of local vesting and uh, trying to help communities get organized to take advantage of building on their strengths and taking advantage of opportunities of their uniqueness. Um, And what he really tries to focus on and try is to, to try and help communities understand their local economies uh, through analysis and set up some strategies for how they can take advantage and address uh, take advantage of some of their of their strengths and, and address some of the opportunities that present themselves. So Josh is going to spend some time trying to take us from the level Amy was at, which is this macro big policy effort uh, with some examples down closer to Main Street. And with that, I'd like to ask Josh to join us up front. That pops out. And don't forget, don't forget. Good morning. Um, Amy, I took out my cops and donuts slide in deference, at, but I kept my Green Bay Packers slide. <laughs> Um, and uh, Colin, thanks for inviting me. I, I would have come only, only to sit in the lobby of this hotel, which is totally wonderful, and, or in the courtyard, which I was doing last night. Um, so as Colin said, I, I uh, for a long time, worked at the National Trust Main Street Center, uh, working with both uh, uh, urban Main Street programs and small town Main Street programs around the country. And um, long before that, or well before that, I was uh, the Main Street manager in my hometown downtown in, uh, in New Jersey, South Orange, New Jersey. And uh, what, New, not South Orange, New Brunswick. New Brunswick. OK, OK. So <laughs> it's good, thanks. New Jersey doesn't get enough applause. So I was in, this was like in South Orange? Yeah. Amazing. OK, so this is all about South Orange. So uh, it, this is like completely random, but like a few years ago, I was doing this, uh, this workshop in Nevada, Missouri, not Nevada. And, um, and at the end, this woman raised her, it was question and answer time. This woman raised her hand, and she said, um, I don't have a question, but I just want to say that I love your accent. <laughs> <laughs> so I just said, thank you. Um, <laughs> Anyway, so, uh, so uh, the, um, for the last eight years, uh, I've had a consulting practice with uh, um, my uh, partner in crime, Kennedy Smith, who was also at the Main Street Center with me. And, uh, and our firm is called the Community Land Use and Economics Group, or CLU Group. And we work with communities on downtown economic development. Um, and this particular topic of um, local investing, crowdfunding, and also how that specifically applies to downtown is one that kind of caught my attention a few years ago. And, uh, um, and I've read Amy's book and, um, and really enjoyed it. And so I'm going to talk mostly about how these things can be used in a downtown setting. And I'm going to throw a lot of ideas out there, and then we can talk about any of them that you want. Um, so brief history of, uh, of Main Street is that 
it used to be the place where you got everything, right? Everybody, they were centers of commerce, but also centers of community, centers of government. Um, and then something bad happened. Uh, it wasn't actually just one bad thing. It was sort of this constellation of things that happened, that were they were events that were unrelated to each other, but they happened more or less around the same time. Um, and one of them was uh, uh, this idea of Euclidean zoning, not named after Euclid, the, uh, the geometrist, uh, but, um, but after Euclid, Ohio, which was the first place to start to, to regulate land use in a way that started to segregate the uses, which used to be that all of the different functions in a, in a city used to just happen together. And Euclidean zoning said they shouldn't happen together. You should have housing over here and industry over here and retail over here. Um, the GI Bill, which uh, created homeownership opportunities on a scale that was unprecedented and started to move huge numbers of people out to the suburbs um, as they kind of pursued the American dream at that time. Um, in 1956, we passed the Interstate Highway Act, which uh, led to uh, a transportation system like we had never known and changed the relationships that people had between where they lived, where they worked, and where they shopped. The concept of um, accelerated depreciation applied specifically or affected specifically downtowns because there was a special exemption, is a special exemption for shopping centers where they can be depreciated much more rapidly than other kinds of, uh, of real estate uh, or other kinds of investments. And, um, and that led to a, uh, a strong economic force to develop tremendous numbers of shopping centers around the country. Then came this idea of revolving credit, which was something that Americans really hadn't had an experience with. And this created a different kind of uh, um, uh, consumer, um, consumer relationship with businesses. And of course, it developed very quickly into the credit card as we know it today. And uh, um, even mechanical th kinds of things had an effect on how all of this development happened. The, the ability to condition large indoor spaces uh, created a way to have these enclosed shopping centers that would not have been possible before air conditioning. And so here you have the whole thing, which is really um, the whole package of all of these businesses being brought into one enclosed space. This was the, this is um, by, uh, um, uh, uh, this is the, the first enclosed uh, um, regional shopping center, which is in a suburb of Minneapolis. Pardon? It's undergoing, it is undergoing huge renovation, but it's still there. Um, and then we started to develop suburbs that looked like this. This is one of uh, the Levittowns. Um, and as people moved out to the suburbs, uh, the uh, husband would go off to work, of course, and the uh, wife would stay home and cook and clean and go slowly crazy in her suburban <laughs> existence. And because retail is, oh, is never a leader, it's always a follower, as people moved out to the suburbs, you started to see retail businesses move out where their customers were. And the first kinds of things that moved out there were convenience kinds of things, restaurants, grocery stores, and things like that. Um, but, uh, but soon, other kinds of retail developed uh, and to fill the need as these, as these households developed further out. The original, uh, the original sort of core, uh, core business of shopping centers was really selling apparel or things related to, to apparel or things to keep you busy while you were shopping for apparel, like someplace to eat. Um, and then came along these guys who really changed the whole dynamic of even for shopping centers. And they were uh, raking in the money because they figured out that if they could sell a much broader range of products, they could really take away not just the business from traditional downtowns, but also the business from, uh, from traditional, uh, traditional malls and shopping centers, which were still focused at that time on, uh, on apparel. So that left downtowns with all kinds of problems, one of which was that businesses, uh, businesses left uh, 
offices that had been in, located in upper stories left, and you had vacant downtown buildings. Um, it also created a kind of arms race in the suburbs, which was that as these big, big boxes grew and started to build within, you know, sort of on each other's turf, that you then started to see big boxes abandon their original stores in favor of building larger stores across the street. Um, and so now we're left with, uh, with uh, vast numbers of these stores unoccupied. So here's a little chart of the growth of retail space in the United States since 1960, when we had about four square feet of retail space per capita in the country. And we now have about 40 square feet per capita. It's not the amount of retail space in itself that's the problem. It's what we can support. So our spending has not grown at the same, as the same rate as our, uh, as our development. And what we can support is something just under 20 square feet per person of retail space, but what we've built is close to double that. The UK, which has the second highest retail space per person in the world, uh, has about 12 square feet per person. China has about two square feet per person. And the world average is somewhere just around four square feet per person. Pricewaterhouse said this, that, we, that the, we're the most over-retail country in the world, the, the most over-retail country in the world hardly needs more shopping, shopping outlets of any kind. And they said this in 2003, long before the financial crisis. But we're still building them, and we're building them in new models, and ironically, many of those models are actually trying to emulate the main streets that we already had. Uh, they're often called new town centers, uh, uh, and, um, and they are cropping up everywhere, including, including this in, uh, um, I'm now forgetting the town, it's in Colorado, Elmwood. Uh, um, so to look at the development of, um, of how downtowns uh, traditionally developed, uh, I'm going to pick on Iowa for a minute because it's flat, unlike Colorado, and so it followed more traditional development patterns. But the same thing applied uh, across the country in, uh, 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 in more or less the same fashion. Towns basically developed about a day's travel from the next town, and that turned out to be about 15 miles. And within, as those towns developed, that was basically their trade area. As we became more mobile, those trade areas expanded, often to 50 miles or even more than that. And as you can see, as the trade areas expanded, each of those communities started to impinge on the trade areas of those around them. It, it used to be that if you needed, you would get almost everything you needed locally, and if you needed something special, you would wait until your next trip to the big city, whatever that big city might be in your, in your area. Um, and so all of these areas start to overlap with each other. There's, there's one business opportunity just south of Des Moines, if anyone wants to. Uh, and what, uh, what this created, uh, what this surplus of space created was a kind of downward spiral for uh, Main Streets. And it began with uh, the increase in vacancies propelled by all of the other places that uh, retail was happening. And as vacancies increased, rents started to drop. Undercapitalized businesses moved in because it was cheaper. Property owners not getting enough money uh, to support the, just the basic upkeep of their property uh, started to defer maintenance in downtown buildings. As they deferred maintenance, property values dropped, the district as the buildings decayed, the district started to look uncared for, and then the whole thing, uh, and then the whole thing repeats. So how do we, um, we needed some new ideas, and, uh, and we started with some really bad ones. Um, <laughs> one of the early ideas in downtown revitalization was to make it look more modern, so we took buildings like this and made them look like this. Ah, uh, that was very good. I liked the, ah, uh, right on time. Um, we uh, put covers on them and, and uh, tried to make them look uniform, which they were never intended to look. Uh, we started to experiment with parking in some dramatic ways. Uh, we had businesses that um, <laughs> what we often call occupied. 
vacancies. This, this isn't it for many of your towns, right? Uh, occupied vacancies. Um, we started themed architecture. This is a Wild West theme in Kansas. Um, and, uh, and tried a bunch of things. This is, the, this is the only South Orange slide I have in here, but my office was in the corner where the air conditioner is. Um, <laughs> but uh, what really made downtowns different and distinguished and kind of gave them their economic uh, um, identity was this idea that they were completely different from all of these things and that they were different from the generica that, that, uh, that was starting to develop everywhere else. That authenticity matters and that authenticity actually has economic value. Uh, the downtown buildings themselves create an environment that lends, uh, that, 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 um, that in itself, by creating an environment that people want to be in, the historic value of, that build, of those buildings actually create value in the downtown. Anyone know where this is? 441 Fort Lauderdale. <laughs> <laughs> How about this? <laughs> Or this, or this, or this. <laughs> All right, here's your um, icon identification quiz. What is this? <laughs> what? It's uh, KFC, good, okay. Good. Very good, okay, you passed. Um, and so this is what we're, and, and so everything that we're developing is starting to make every place look more and more like every other place. Um, this is, I, I just put this in because this is, um, this is Tony Goldman, who, if any of you have heard of him, uh, uh, died this past week. The, probably one of the greatest developers ever, ever. And, um, and he's the one who originally, who was originally responsible for the revitalization of Soho in Manhattan. Um, he bought 18 industrial buildings in the 1970s and started rehabbing them um, when no one would, wanted to be in Soho. He did the same in Miami Beach, Florida, um, in, uh, in a neighborhood of Philadelphia. He was starting to work in Detroit. Um, and he did all kinds of amazing things, including this in another neighborhood of Miami called Wynwood, where, which was an industrial neighborhood where he invited graffiti artists from all over the world to come and paint these buildings and created this amazing arts district. And it was this way of thinking about places and placemaking that uh, uh, just is really unusual and extraordinary. Okay, so here's your next test. Um, what Tony Goldman knew and had an innate sense for was what was cool and what wasn't cool. And we all know it. It's sort of like you know the Supreme Court and pornography, and uh, you know it when you see it. Um, so this is not cool. Okay. Good. <laughs> all right. Not cool. I think that's it. Oh no, there's more. Um, so main streets are great places for all kinds of reasons. One is that they typically are the place where small businesses get their start and, um, and they become incubators as a whole place. They become incubators um, even though, and they may have specific business incubators within them. Um, they're places that are already built. They don't require any new development to, to create economic development. Um, they are spaces that, because of all the other stuff that has happened in the development of retail space, main streets are relatively cheap places to, um, uh, to start a new business. And they are infinitely adaptable. Uh, buildings on main street over the centuries have been used for one business after another after another, from gas station to restaurant, from car dealership to furniture store. All of these, all of these buildings have seen multiple lives. There are also places which are uh, full of ancillary services, things that you need if you're going to start a non-retail business in Main Street. They're full of the things that you and your employees want to have nearby, restaurants, post office, printing services, things like that. 
Um, so how do you make a commercial district economies healthy? Well, we're going to look at a whole range of things, but, um, but at the core is this idea that there needs to be some kind of strategy, some kind of market-based strategy that organizes the downtown, uh, from, that make, takes it from sort of a disorganized um, uh, economic, um, uh, e uh, economic um, place to one that has, a, that has a thrust. And you can sort of noodle it out that uh, revitalizing a downtown is essentially a real estate problem. It's you need to have, the businesses need to, to produce enough sales and revenues in order to support the rent levels that can in turn support the maintenance of the buildings. That we often talk about rents downtown being too high, but if the rents aren't high enough, they can't support the maintenance of the buildings themselves. And so the downtown enters that cycle that I talked about a minute ago. Uh, so what does a market strategy, a, mar a market strategy is essentially the intersection of two things. It's the intersection of what the market can support, that is what the customers can support, and what the community desires. And that's kind of the core of community-based economic development. Typically in trying to do uh, this work, we've taken a scattershot approach of saying, whatever we can bring downtown is the thing we want. Anything that opens is better than nothing. But in fact, because downtowns have a different function today than they used to, um, they need to be more focused themselves. Often, they need to be destinations, and in order to be a destination for people to come from other places and spend money here, there needs to be something special about this place and about its mix of businesses, not just about its, the, 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 the um, historic atmosphere creates a reason for people to come, but there needs to be a focus to the businesses themselves and the collection of those businesses that, uh, um, that draws in customers who would otherwise be going to Walmart and shopping centers for their day-to-day -day needs. Um, and so if we look at this, in this chart, uh, this is sort of a, um, uh, just a way to visualize how to do this. If each dot represents a business in the downtown um, and, the, uh, and the, um, the variety is represented uh, on the y-axis and on the x-axis uh, is just the price point, um, you can start to see how a downtown might have a mix of businesses that's sort of all over the map. But over time, by providing some assistance, by recruiting new businesses to the district, you can start to focus that business mix in particular clusters or even in particular price points. So you can start to move some businesses um, into a higher price point if that's what the customer, uh, uh, the, uh, if that's what the customer mix uh, expects. You could start to move some businesses from, say, restaurants toward entertainment. Um, you can start to recruit new businesses to fill in some gaps that may not be filled yet. And you can start to develop one or two or three core strengths of the downtown that serve, uh, um, uh, that serve as, a, um, as a market strategy for the district. Downtowns, in addition to retail, they need all kinds of uses. Um, they need to be a mix of things because they're functioning at all different times of day and they're serving all different kinds of, of users. So they need offices. They need people living downtown, especially now that office businesses are not typically located, uh, are not as commonly located on the upper floors of downtown. And they make terrific, uh, terrific residential spaces. Um, they're great for light industry and the, um, uh, and the uh, um, small entrepreneur who needs a small place to start. They need to be places that are more than what they were before uh, beyond their, their original retail core. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grab a glass of water. <laughs> Okay, um, so you've probably had time to read this already. <laughs> um, average retail rents are dropping. 
um, although they seem to have stabilized in the last year. Uh, there, it, there was less new retail space built in 2011 than in any other year on record. Um, the International Council of Shopping Centers e estimates that 25 to 30 percent of shopping center space will need to be adapted for non-retail uses. And unlike Main Street buildings, shopping centers, and especially big box stores, are notoriously difficult uh, to reuse. There are examples, of, there are great examples of them, but they are, uh, but it's hard to do. Um, the, uh, what we've sort of, we've sort of boxed ourselves in because we, our uh, consumption has been fueled by the availability of credit. And as we have uh, maxed out our ability to spend, which kind of fueled the development of uh, retail space, we've sort of found ourselves in this tight spot of what to do next. What I think is gonna happen in the future of downtowns is that there's gonna be more, um, uh, there's gonna be a greater thrust of retail that's oriented around reuse, um, a greater thrust of retail that's oriented around repairs, um, and there's probably gonna be, as we, as consumption no longer is the driver of development of retail space, um, I think downtowns are going to be the place where that's going to um, where that's going to happen. This is actually a um, a very high end vintage clothing store, uh, a resale vintage clothing store. Uh, they have sto they have a store in Manhattan and a store in Los Angeles. Um, this is uh, another version of a um, of a secondhand store called Pass the Baton, where uh, the consigner actually writes a little story about the item that's being sold in the store and sort of creates, creates something that can be passed on um, to the next person that buys it. Uh, this is a, um, uh, this is a bag, bar, bag, borrow, or steal, which is a, an online business that essentially rents high-end um, uh, 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 handbags and women's accessories. You can rent them for a weekend or you can rent them for a season. This is uh, Hand Me Down Howie's, which is a UK company that manufactures uh, new clothing that's designed to last for generations. And what they do is inside each article is a place where you write your name as the first owner and then there's a place for each subsequent owner to write, to write his or her name. Um, there's a whole rise of uh, collaborative consumption, this idea of uh, um, tool sharing, of other kinds of uh, resource lending, um, and, uh, and this was uh, one of the, um, a, a book that's uh, about that movement. There, um, this is in Ann Arbor, Michigan, um, uh, an example of a repair store in, um, in downtown Ann Arbor. Um, part of the solution for downtown businesses is to think about how they can um, expand their marketing channels beyond the people who just walk in the front door. And there are lots of ways that businesses are doing that. I just took a walk uh, downtown here, and the bookstore um, the, uh, the bookstore has actually assigned, though not in neon, very similar to this, which is that um, through eBay, through Etsy, through Amazon, um, lots of Main Street businesses are actually creating an online presence in a way that's far less expensive than setting up their own, their own online retailing sites. On the other side of that equation is something that's much, much more local, which is, re which is we're seeing businesses return to some very, very traditional kinds of retailing, like local delivery, um, and uh, even Pizza Hut was experimenting with putting up, uh, with uh, um, putting up kiosks in unusual places. <laughs> uh, vending machines, another way for businesses to extend their marketing channels. This is a vending machine that sells art for only $5. Um, shoes, food trucks, which are not just an urban phenomenon, they're also happening in small towns, which is a way for um, 
uh, new entrepreneurs to get to, to test out an idea. And, um, and there are lots of cities and towns that are trying to find ways to encourage this uh, without impinging on um, uh, the existing retail businesses downtown. Um, and this is, an, and, uh, and then there is the whole bucket of tools that communities are creating to help small businesses develop. And this gets into some of the things that Amy was talking about. Um, ways to create capital that small businesses can take advantage of. Um, this is a restaurant in uh, Effington, Illinois. It's called Firefly. Um, it is, so Amy was talking about Lions or local investment opportunity networks. Um, this is something of the same, uh, sort of the same idea, even though it wasn't called that. It was uh, um, in Effington, there were uh, there were a handful of business uh, business leaders who needed a, who wanted a place to go to lunch that was a nice sit down restaurant that didn't exist in Effington, and so they pulled together just a handful of people who each invested in a, in this new restaurant called Firefly. Um, it was uh, the two entrepreneurs are um, Niall and his wife Christy Campbell who were originally from Effington and were recruited back. They had moved to the West Coast and they were re recruited back to open this restaurant. They became equity investors in the business too, as did this handful of, uh, of Effington business leaders. And that's how the business started. Local investors coming together in really a way that's happened for centuries, um, but in, in, with a new twist in, uh, in this case. Uh, this is a waking cafe in Oakland. Um, it, started by a guy who already had one cafe, and he, but he didn't have the capital to open a second. He raised $100,000 essentially in pre-sales, that is selling, essentially selling gift cards for sales that customers would use later. Uh, he raised $35,000 in prepaid by selling prepaid discount cards, and another $5,000, and, um, uh, 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 and the rest was raised from individuals who um, uh, put in $5,000 each into the business. Uh, this is chocolate. This is Hotel Chocolates, which sold uh, chocolate bonds, where you were paid. Your interest was paid back in chocolate. <laughs> For some people, better than money, right? Um, and uh, and then there are all kinds of things. Uh, as Amy talked about, some of them like Kickstarter. This is Indiegogo. Um, these platforms, which at this point are mostly raising, uh, are a way to raise capital for projects, but when the new SEC rules come out, um, they will also be, they should also become platforms for raising money for businesses. Uh, there are a number of peer-to-peer -peer, uh, lending intermediaries that have essentially organized what has always existed, which is, there, or what has always existed is friends and family lending to uh, friends and family, um, and even lending within very tight-knit communities, uh, even among people who may not know each other. Um, but what these sites have done is uh, to, cr to start to match make between people who want to invest money and people who need money to start a business. And they've organized the, re the repayment system and the collateral system so that that's possible. Um, this is uh, something called Meanwhile Downtown, which is a project in uh, Florence, South Carolina. And the project is to rent three downtown vacancies with three month with three months of free rent. And, um, uh, and this was a campaign they did uh, a couple years ago. Um, this is something that just came out uh, last month from Detroit, which is Detroit issued an RFP, essentially asking entrepreneurs to submit proposals to develop pop-up or permanent businesses in a particular business district. And the city of Detroit would support that with a variety of tools, including capital, technical assistance, and, uh, and um, uh, leasing assistance, and build-out. And, uh, uh, um, and build out. This is a space that's in New York. It's, a, it's essentially a permanent pop-up space. So in this storefront, all kinds of the, um, different businesses change out monthly. So, um, and this doesn't, this, um, uh, this concept could be adapted to any store in any, uh, in any city or small town. Uh, 
Um, this is a guy who wrote Ed's Martian book, uh, a book about the Phoenix landing on Mars in 2008, and he opened a bookstore with the emphasis on a bookstore. It only sells one book, <laughs> his book, um, and uh, what? Red must be really cheap. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was, it was a publicity stunt in a sense, but it's a, it's a completely different way of thinking of what downtown retail has to be, what, you know, um, uh, what a bookstore has to be. Um, it's sort of a social commentary on what a bookstore is um, in a weird way. Um, and then there's, uh, um, there's this phenomenon which is happening everywhere, which is this idea of, um, of uh, collaborative workspaces. This is the Hive in Washington, D.C., uh, a, um, uh, a co-working space where entrepreneurs uh, rent desks and, and, uh, and uh, um, work there, but they also share ideas and, have, uh, um, and, and create collaboration. This is uh, Indy Hall in, um, in Philadelphia, and I'm actually a member here and I use this space. Uh, it's, a, it's Independence Hall but Independence spelled E-N-T-S because it's around the, cor around the corner from Independence Hall. And um, I'm probably the oldest person there, not by, there's a, there are a couple people older than me, but um, it's mostly 20-somethings, a lot of tech people, um, and uh, uh, it's, a, it's a great, it's a, and it's growing. We just doubled, doubled in size. Um, so then there are all of these, there, there's this whole series of businesses that are essentially community-owned businesses. And this falls more in the category of retail businesses. Um, you've probably all heard of cooperatives, but there is a whole range of community-owned business types, including cooperatives, which are sort of fairly specific in how they're established, um, but businesses that are owned by small, uh, small groups of investors, businesses that are, uh, that are stock ownership, um, this is Township Grocery, which is a cooperative. It's in the tiny town of Bonaparte, Iowa, a population 450. This uh, Township Grocery was started uh, in the 1990s, and it's still open. Um, this is, uh, uh, cooperatives can range to uh, worldwide brands that you know. Uh, these are uh, uh, producer cooperatives as opposed to retail cooperatives. Um, the Green Bay Packers, which are, is a team essentially owned by its community. Um, but on, again, on a smaller level, this is the Seville Arts Cooperative in Charlottesville, Virginia, where artists get to keep 90% of the retail sale of the work that they sell, as opposed to a typical gallery arrangement, which is more like 60%. Uh, this is a tiny cooperative that happens to be in Los Angeles. It's, uh, it's a Bicycle Kitchen. They don't sell bicycles, they don't fix bicycles. What they offer is a space where you can fix your own bicycle and they have expertise there to help you do it. This is the Merck, which is in Powell, uh, Powell Wyoming. One of, the early, um, one of the early stock ownership sort of general merchandise stores. Uh, Saranac Lake that Amy was talking about very much modeled uh, its business on the experience of the Merck and the Merck is still in business as well. Uh, this is a small manufacturing business in Oakland, uh, which is a um, uh, micro apparel manufacturer, started with financial seed money from a community development corporation there. Uh, and what they're doing is they're trying to do job training for uh, members, uh, particularly of the Latino community, which is, uh, which is huge in this part of Oakland. Um, and what they, the customer base that they've created is to manufacture piece go, um, sample goods for Los Angeles designers. Um, and so that's what their, uh, um, that's their work, or Los Angeles and San Francisco designers. Um, this is the New Deal Cafe, which is in Greenbelt, Maryland, a cooperatively owned restaurant, uh, which also serves as a community space and um, uh, has been in business for about 15 years. Um, has grown in scale, uh, but they essentially they hire professional kitchen staff and a, and a restaurant manager, but the business itself is owned by the members of the cooperative. There's um, uh, combining these ideas 
is, a, is something that's starting to happen um, kind of using a whole bunch of these very similar tools from crowdfunding to uh, crowdsourcing, which is this idea of using crowds to develop places. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Um, this is a guy, uh, this guy is uh, Neil Takamoto, and um, he's based in Washington, and he's just an incredibly creative thinker about uh, using crowdsourcing to solve all kinds of problems, not just urban problems or not just downtown problems. But we've been working with him in uh, Bristol, Connecticut, which used to look like this. Um, and then something bad happened. And then it looked like this. And then it looked like this. And now it looks like this. So um, the city of Bristol, which, had, which essentially replaced its downtown with a shopping center, is now in the process of figuring out how to rebuild its downtown or how to create a place. And they, uh, um, Bristol uh, entered a development agreement with a, um, a group of developers called Resident, uh, Renaissance Downtowns, uh, Residence, yeah, Renaissance Downtowns. And, uh, and we've been doing some market analysis for them. But what Neil has been doing is uh, using crowdsourcing as a way to figure out what downtown Bristol should be. And he's created all kinds of real-time communities and online communities to generate ideas about, uh, about what Bristol should be and to involve the public in ways that they've never been involved before. So he's put online all kinds of, you know, floated all kinds of business concepts that people have voted on to say what kinds of things they want to see. Um, they've organized uh, all kinds of public meetings and events in raising awareness and generating momentum around this. Uh, they, um, uh, they were involved in, um, uh, uh, as a, you know, sort of political force with a lowercase p in helping the town um, approve this development agreement. Uh, and uh, the first business that has come out of this crowdsourced idea just opened a few months ago. It's called Bare Bones Cafe. And I don't know if they and what Neil is now doing is uh, he's created, he's, he's taken all of these individuals that have become involved in this crowdsourcing work and has basically harnessed them or, or uh, um, given them license to go out and actually make contact with new businesses trying to recruit them to downtown. And this is sort of, this is just from one of his uh, um, active websites where um, the individuals next to these names of businesses are the individuals who have signed on to say, I'm going to go out and talk to these guys and see if I can convince them to come here. So there's no rules anymore. Um, the p communities are trying all kinds of things and the and the ways that they're doing them, sort of like anything that is, um, n n nothing is, is too far-fetched to try. Um, this, is a, this is a building in, um, uh, in Fairbanks, Alaska, a landmark building called the Polaris Building. And uh, this Fairbanks used a public art project uh, to try and save the building and to try and find a, a new use for it. So people would write on this blackboard uh, ideas of things that they, uh, memories or things they would like the building to be. Um, this is a, this is a really wonderful project by an artist named um, Candy Chang. And what she does is she sends out essentially a box of, um, you know, my name is tags, except they're I wish this was tags. I think they should be I wish this were, but I'm not, uh, I, and, um, and the sticker, and, and communities kind of take this on as a public art kind of community development project where the stickers are distributed free, and then people put them on anything uh, and try and, and use it to generate idea thinking about what uh, a place could become. All of these tools uh, require that cities, because cities are the ones who have the power to do this, think about planning and land use 
in ways that really favor downtowns or at least don't discriminate against downtown as places to develop. Um, rather than making downtown the hardest place to develop, downtown should be the easiest place to develop. And we should be thinking about how uh, to help entrepreneurs create new things out of these existing bu buildings. If someone wants to create upper store housing downtown or create a bed and breakfast up, uh, above a storefront downtown, we shouldn't be thinking about all the reasons why these buildings can't comply with current codes about why the, about, uh, um, to develop those spaces, but about how we can make them safe, but also uh, reuse them in ways that maximize the use of the buildings. Because the more, the more space you use in a building, the easier it is to make that building uh, uh, financially viable. There's a whole other category of stuff that, uh, that um, uh, is part of creating downtown environments that work. And, um, and these are, we, you could call uh, um, interactivity or ephemera, things that just make people engage with the place. Um, and they, they come from like tiny little things that just make you turn around um, to uh, lots of places are just putting in places to sit, places to look around, places to interact. Um, these are some uh, uh, footsteps that are embedded in a sidewalk in Seattle uh, that uh, can, teach you, uh, can teach you different dances um, as you're uh, walking down the sidewalk. This is um, the First Amendment wall in Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh, just a, a wonderful, wonderful public, um, uh, uh, public art project where you can write anything you want on this wall. People write loving things. People write hateful things. Um, and every morning it's erased and it starts all over again. Uh, these are um, the, have any of you heard of the Ferry Door Project in Ann Arbor? Um, ferry Doors are a little art project where artists create these miniature doors and they're installed around downtown and it's kind of, it, it, it's created this sort of um, um, uh, hidden scavenger hunt where you can go around downtown Ann Arbor looking for these little, um, these little doors. They're inside and outside. Uh, this is in uh, a neighborhood I used to live in in Boston uh, called Jamaica Plain. Um, this is a secondhand shop called Boomerangs. Uh, they had a bunch of uh, old wedding dresses that were on display for a while. They, um, they dressed them up for holidays like Mardi Gras. And then, uh, and then eventually they needed to sell, you know, they needed to move these wedding dresses. So um, you probably can't read the sign in the middle, but it says all wedding dresses now half off. Um, this, is, uh, this is public art created by the public. It's kind of, um, you know, it's gross, but it's cool. Uh, and this is, um, this is in Seattle. Yeah, it's all chewing gum if you can't. Um, this is uh, the Yellow Arrow Project, which is another way of engaging people with a place. It's placing a, placing a yellow arrow somewhere physically and then creating a, um, a geo link to it on yellowarrow.com and sort of saying something about the place or what you experienced there. Um, sometimes these things are really tiny and, it, and this is just a dry cleaner moving their sewing machine to the front window so that even in a business where nothing else is really happening that you would observe or look into as a window display, this creates some activity on the street. It's important that you, as community leaders, and um, uh, all of us become advocates for preservation because it also means that we're advocates for um, recycling of uh, downtown buildings. This is, a, um, this is sort of a thumbnail sketch of the amount of embodied energy that exists in a typical Main Street building. That would be a typical three-story storefront building. Um, the energy embodied in a, in a typical uh, brick uh, commercial building uh, of, of, uh, um, of that size is about 400, is, um, sorry, uh, is about 3,900 gallons of gasoline, uh, which is about 8.4 years worth of gasoline for the typical American. So that's 
that, so one of those buildings equals the recycling of 1.3 million aluminum cans. A lot of businesses have already figured out that preservation and cool historic districts are the, are, um, the way to make a place that people want to be. And I think our job is to emulate some of that. So um, the, 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 it's, it's not one idea. It's bringing people together around all kinds of tools, many of which have been completely transformed by the tools that are available online through crowdsourcing, crowdfunding, and things like that. Um, and thinking about this as a, a market-based strategy that can really happen by starting to put one thing in front of another and, um, and ultimately creating uh, <laughs> great downtown places. Um, thanks very much. Well, I think it depends on what the mix of businesses downtown is now. So if it's a place where there just aren't any, there aren't, there aren't enough restaurants, there aren't the right kind of restaurants, um, there's only dinner restaurants, no lunch places, um, it can be a viable thing. There's other examples of um, essentially mobile retail, which are not food. Um, and those have been happening too, where someone, um, uh, I was gonna. I, I, it, it, I thought about it too late to put a slide in here of, of some of those examples. But there are there are um, apparel designers who are trying who are doing things in mobile retailing, and um, all of those are, are are things you can try. And I think it's a way of how it's regulated also that makes it, whether it's, um, whether it's sort of, uh, uh, giving someone an unfair advantage, that if you if you price the permit at a point where it's costing the entrepreneur something to be something you know something meaningful to be there uh, then you know arguably you're not you're not create you're not creating an unlevel playing field yeah I can make up an answer to that. <laughs> Did you hear him back? The, the questions about civic buildings and civic features as being, uh, 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 anything specific about them? Oh, or? Uh, parks, transportation centers, yeah. libraries, municipal buildings, I mean, what's their role? Yeah, well, th I think the main role is to keep, it, whenever we can, is to keep those functions what they are because city halls, post offices, libraries are traffic generators. And by being traffic generators, they bring customers downtown who then end up, then end up doing other things when they're there. Um, in the unfortunate cases where we have post offices that close, and there are gonna be a lot more post offices that close over the next, you know, uh, over the next years, um, where you have libraries that have closed, or, uh, or city halls that, I, I hope I'm not offending anyone here, that for reasons I do not understand will build city hall, will build their new city hall um, uh, out in Greenfields far from downtown. Um, then it's a matter of figuring out how those buildings can be reused and that's a bigger challenge because some of them were very purpose built. Um, so then we have to think about, you know, some of the, some of the ideas I, uh, 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 I talked about, about, you know, co-working spaces or um, uh, um, small industry development or things like that. I, I guess what I meant a little more is how do they add to the design feel of the downtown that's an attractive place? I think they're, I mean, I think they're, you know, downtowns uh, typically evolved around those buildings and those places. And, and oftentimes it may be unconscious in one's experience of a downtown, but those places serve actually as geographic markers. So when you come in, 
when you drive into a downtown, I mean, it depends on the part of the country you're in, but like in New England, when you see a white church steeple, you know that you're coming into a downtown. Or um, uh, uh, um, uh, civic buildings often mark the center of the downtown. So when you see City Hall, or you see the post office, you know that you're in the middle. Um, those are, those are kind of things that, you know, we may not be aware of it, but they're how, the, how we sort of organize ourselves when we get there. So they're, they're very important. Uh, uh, go ahead. Uh, California has passed legislation that says they'll now tax internet sales. Uh -huh. If a business had a retail location, what is your opinion on how that will affect retail locations in downtown? Um, I, well, the idea that, uh, you know, what California is trying to do, or what California has done, and what I think is going to, is inevitable, is that uh, online sales are going to be, are, are going to be taxed at the same as uh, bricks and mortar locations. And that's, you know, it, 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 when I buy stuff at, on Amazon, which I do from time to time, um, that's going to, that's going to make, that's going to make uh, um, bricks and mortar locations more competitive with uh, um, with online locations, it's um, I, I think it's the fair thing to do. But that's um, you know, it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna disrupt a lot. But uh, uh, and I don't I don't claim to know how it's gonna how it's gonna shake out. If you if you read uh, just um, a couple of days ago, uh, I read something in the Times about um, Amazon's building. They're now building their distribution warehouses. They're on a huge building spree to build distribution warehouses as close as they possibly can to all of their major uh, um, customer points. So they're building huge warehouse right outside Los Angeles. They're building another warehouse in, in Oakland um, and all, doing that all around the country so that they can offer at least overnight, regular overnight delivery at no extra charge for everything they sell. And in some places they're gonna offer same day delivery. So it's kind of, that's how they're trying to compete with being able to go into a big box and get and get it that day. Um, there was a hand up. Oh, sorry, I, I didn't see. It. Yeah. Thanks for your comment. You suggested that consumption is no longer the driver of a downtown retail space occupancy, something along those lines. It was unclear to me what you were arguing. Was it that? I think it's both. I think that um, I think that consumption is not going to be the driver of growth in, in de of uh, um, that we are not we're we're done with creating more retail space and more consumption as a way of driving uh, of driving retail growth. I think what we're going to start to see and what we're starting to see is the growth of businesses. But uh, uh, um, certainly, creative businesses like like you're uh, talking about, and also businesses that reuse and recycle um, uh, existing um, existing goods. Yeah. Um, so the, a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about, both Amy and I, have been about ways that individuals or the private sector can, um, uh, can stimulate entrepreneurs, can, can uh, um, stimulate uh, new businesses, entrepreneurs, and so on. The, in terms of infrastructure, I think the answer is what has always been the job of cities and towns, which is to create a physical environment that's a good place for businesses to develop. And um, I think that includes some of the things we sort of think of as, as, as um, like starting points for uh, downtown revitalization, improved sidewalks, improved streetscapes, improved plantings, um, uh, downtown you know, pocket parks, um, uh, parking structures in some cases. 
um, the kinds of things that create an environment where the business activity um, can take place. It's just like all infrastructure. I think it creates, it, it, it creates transportation connections, it creates um, um, a, 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 an environment that works. So, and then the business development can happen within that. All right. So we're going to take a short little break while we switch our presentations, and then we're going to move to the next section session that brings it down even a little bit more locally. <laughs>